Um, yeah, so the title of the present slide is a little different. So I'm presenting at scale, scalable private advertising with practical, trusted third parties. Um, so first, why do we want this? So advertising supports websites. We all know this. Advertising depends on predicting which ads result in interaction and showing these ads preferentially to users. You want to show ads that people will click on. This requires information on user behavior and some very sophisticated modeling. Also, and currently this information is gathered by the advertising network. They also need this information for things like billing. You actually need to charge people money based on how often the ad is shown or clicked. Very few people like this setup of affairs. Not advertisers because there's all sorts of regulation associated with tracking user data, and not users because they don't like being tracked. We would want privacy preserving advertising. This isn't a new idea. There's been a lot of work on it before. So let's discuss what that looks like. Um, also, very few deployed systems. And we'll, we'll end up hitting on some of the reasons why systems in the literature have not been deployed. So privacy preserving advertising involves a client that sits on your computer and knows what you want to see and what you'll click on. It picks the advertising to display and transmits the information back to the server about what happened when the advertisement was displayed. So somehow it has to get the ad, somehow it has to transmit this information back. And the server is going to aggregate this information for various purposes. We already talked about billing. There's also demographic targeting. Some advertisers want to show ads to certain people. Um, in the print industry, for instance, different magazines will have different kinds of ads because they're read by different people. Uh, updating advertising prices and selection. This is the thing that uh, Google pioneered, or several ad networks pioneered in the early 2000s where you have dynamic auctions for ad pricing and you need to know how well ads are doing. So we focused on the reporting bit, sending the information back to the server in this project. Um, this is part of a larger effort, and this was the real critical point on which we could either do things or not. So like I said, it's part of an industrial project, so here were the requirements we came up with. We're gonna have tens of thousands of, of possible advertisements, advertisements that users could see. We have to gather at least eight bits of information on each advertisement. This is actually an overestimate. Um, we knew that we needed definitely four. We needed displayed, clicked on, and also unique displays and unique clicked on. So if you clicked on an ad twice, you'd only send the unique bit once, back once. 20 impressions per day per user with eight advertisements per impression. 300 million users. This multiplies out to 48 gigabytes per day if there's no overhead whatsoever associated with the reporting scheme. This was for in-browser advertising, so there's no incentive for fraud by websites. We don't need to worry about fraud protection that much. We, we trust our clients, well, somewhat. We also need exact billing data. We thought about various, pro various solutions based on statistical sampling. They were not things that the people who knew about advertising were excited about. Existing schemes fall short. First thing you do when you have a problem like this, you look to see if someone else has solved it. Well, there were too many users and connections for Tor to work. Uh, too many connections is really the sticking point here. It's not the bandwidth, it's every establishment of connection just eats up resources you don't have a lot of. There were too many advertisements for existing Elgamal-based systems. Uh, the Elgamal-based systems take the a vector with one entry per ad, encrypt that homomorphically with Elgamal, send it up to the server, and the overheads from this are huge. Uh, our scheme is based on them, it has various efficiency improvements, but just the standard ones in the literature were too slow. There's too much data for mixed nets past the third party to decrypt. 48 gigabytes per day doesn't sound like a lot. It is, however, a lot when you're considering asking someone to handle it for you for free. Trusted computing has been suggested. It requires special hardware. SGX is not yet available on EC2 instances. That was the level of deployability we needed. Uh, so let's talk about Elgamal-based systems some more. You have a vector of bits with one entry per, adver per advertisement times things you're reporting on. You're gonna set the bit, we're gonna just talk about displays for the moment. You set the bit corresponding to one you showed. So you have 30 ads, you have 30 bits. You set one saying, yes, I showed that ad showed ad number three. I didn't show any of the others. We encrypt with a key held by a third party, 
So the server doesn't know the key, but the third party is going to decrypt with it. The server adds together all the vectors, and the third party decrypts. Now, we have to prove that each vector is correctly formed. The reason for this is advertisers might say, yes, I saw this ad a few billion times, and that turns out to be a negative number, so they can get free displays. So you have to prove separately that each encrypted value is zero or one, and you have to prove that the sum of all the entries you encrypted is one. All right, so this proof is what really kills the performance. We'll get later to example to our, how our system actually performs in practice, but it's really the proving overhead in bandwidth terms, in computational terms, that stops this from being viable. So how do we get around this? So there's a uh, pre-existing thing called the gross Colby's membership proof. If you have a Peterson commitment, you can show knowledge of an opening to a, any member of a set with a proof of logarithmic size. And I've grouped together elements and scalars because we're using elliptic curves, point compression, they're about the same size. So importantly, this is logarithmic length. It's also efficient to encrypt and decrypt. So how do we turn that into a proof of the statement? So what's the statement we want to prove? We want to show that we have a collection of Elgamal ciphertexts, and exactly one of them is an encryption of one, and all the other ones are encryptions of zero. So the verifier is going to pick some random numbers. I'm presenting this interactively. We de-interactivize it through uh, the Fiat Shamir heuristic in the ROM. So you pick a bunch of random numbers. The prover then multiplies all these ciphertexts together and shows us an encryption of one of the AIs. How do you show that an Elgamal ciphertext is an encryption of a member of a certain set? Um, well, you can transfer it to a commitment. So you say, they send you a commitment, they prove that this commitment is a commitment to the encryption of the ciphertext, and trans use a growth Covey's proof to show that the uh, commitment is in fact a commitment to one of the AI. And these are all proofs of knowledge of some opening because Peterson commitments are hiding. Uh, the proof size is logarithmic in the number of uh, ciphertexts. If you generate the AIs through some PRF, then you only need to send, you send the ciphertext and there's logarithmic extra data. The verification time is dominated by three multi-exponentiations with, with scalars of size, or sorry, it's three multi-exponentiations. The number of things you're multi-exponentiating is uh, n, not one giant one of 8n. That one giant one of 8n is what you get when you try to do an or standard or proof of each one of the ciphertexts individually. Um, so we investigated various proof techniques, and the fastest proof we could find for the usual prove each element separately is either zero or one, used um, eight n, used one giant multi exponentiation length eight n. We have to optimize it further, so we use long public keys to shrink ciphertext size. Your your public key is now length n, and you use one randomness to encrypt all the entries. So this removes one element from every single entry, as there's only one random element, and all the other ones are just encryptions. So that cuts your ciphertext size in half. We use smaller challenges to reduce verification time. The AIs from the previous slide, they're no longer randomly picked elements, they're no longer randomly picked scalars. They're randomly picked string, strings one half the length of the scalars. And this decreases our security proportionally, we can afford that. Put multiple bits in each ciphertext element. This is where the advantages of our new technique start to show through. So we're just encrypting zero or one, and this seems very wasteful. After all, if I know that there aren't going to be more than two to the 32 advertisements, why not write down, take this vector of how many times things were shown and take two to the 32 times the first element plus the second element and encrypt that thing. So I encrypt pairs of bits in each element. And then after I add it up, provided there's no carrying, in other words, I've added less than two to the 32 vectors, then I can decrypt the result by doing a discrete logarithm computation. 
the reason you can't do that with, without a modification of the proof is that the or proofs, you'll have to show that it's zero or one or two to the 32 or two to the 32 plus one. And each one of those cases multiplies the size of the proofs. Um, here, we can get away with that. We're showing that our commitment is now 32 times, or two to the 32 times an AI, or an AI, or two to the 32 plus one times an AI. So that's much simpler. We can also send data from multiple impressions at once. We had one commitment, why not put multiple commitments in and prove that each one of them is one of the AIs to say that it's not that one of these uh, entries is encryption of one, but they're all encryptions of, of small numbers and the sum of those small numbers is n. And so this way we had these 20 impressions per day and we can report three or four of them at a time. We also don't compress most points. So point compression turns out to be a bottleneck for verification. Decompressing all those ciphertexts takes a lot of time. Yes, there's a bandwidth cost. We've made up for that by shrinking the ciphertext size and by packing in our bits tightly. Also, lots of reduction in the constant factors. So sit down, try to optimize the heck out of everything. Final protocol. So we have a vector of size 4n. I'm going to make sure all my indices are nicely divisible. And some of it most m basis vectors. Not necessarily distinct. We encrypt some AJs. The AJs are defined as this nice sum of some EIs. And then it challenges a bunch of RIs. There's uh, n of them. And then we compute the cipher uh, sum or product over, sorry, we take the product of AI times CI, same as before. Then we send the ciphertexts along with commitments, and the product of these commitments is a commitment to RJ times AJ, summed up. Then you prove that each AI is a commitment to one D, D squared, or D cubed times a challenge. That's one of the RIs. There's a high probability the ciphertext is correctly formed if this check, if this proof works. Uh, that can be shown by just looking at zeros of, po of linear polynomials. Uh, to prove that we actually have a protocol, this becomes a protocol that proves what we want it to, we use some standard composition results on serial composition of sigma protocols, plus a little bit of arithmetic showing that if you have a sum of a bunch of numbers, half of them are, or you have, a, you have an inner product with a random vector, then um, and its value is of this form, then chances are that you are a correctly formed vector. All right, let's look at the cost comparison of our protocol to the ones that existed before. So we have a Paillet-based scheme, agnostic, which is the previous Elgamal-based protocol, uh, and AdScale, our new protocol. What we see is that the costs for Paillet are reasonable, but they quickly grow as the number of ads grows to a point where they're no longer small. Um, for comparison, the amount of money we would be getting is about one dollar per thousand ads. So it rises up to about one, to about um, what, ten, tenth of a thousandth. Um, whereas ad scale stays a very small amount of money. Um, so it's below two percent of a revenue. Agnostic wipes out everything. Now let's look at the size. Bandwidth really matters here especially for mobile clients. And we see that we have significant bandwidth savings over agnostic in the Paillet-based scheme, um, which really make it practical at the high end with 64,000 ads. Two megabytes per day is a lot, but per impression, uh, we can get away with it in a way that we couldn't with 20 megabytes. We have far better scaling in existing systems. This scheme is not currently in use. There are other reasons why the project, why it wasn't deployed. There's also a large gap between theory and practice in this area, but we think we've made some progress towards clo closing it. Initial application avoided most of the hard problems in this area. Um, we think that we've solved the problem of reporting results. We think that our performance is good enough that if we were talking about deploying privacy preserving ads, that we've solved the problem entirely. Uh, implementation is not up yet. It will be released. It has some problems that need to get fixed first. It was really a proof of concept more than something you could put straight into production. 
That's it. And uh, are there any questions? If there are questions, then uh, please state your name and the affiliation. Sure. So, are the, both the costs and the sizes are those? Do the linear are those linear, or do you get benefits as as you get more and more ads there? Ah, so the answer is that for the two first schemes, PIE and agnostic, they're very close to linear. For ad scale, it's a linear term plus a logarithmic term. So there is some benefit to, so it, it acts like a log, log plus a linear, and the log is initially much bigger. If I understood it correctly, this solves the problem of reporting back the number of impressions, the number of clicks. Is there any, advancement in actually sending the client what to display. Which of those ads that might be in the client cache already, bit vector of which should it display now? So we've thought about how to present ads. Um, the issue is that CPIR and various uh, PIR schemes, so private information retrieval schemes, they end up being not competitive with the trivial one of just send everything to the client. And our initial application was mostly text, um, so was, that was considered, oh, we can probably get away with sending it all to the client. Or you could try and do various tricks with multiple CDNs, um, but yeah, they're, they're, that is still a big problem. Because that is another privacy issue. I mean, ideally you would probably want the client to decide what to show at what point. So it's, it's not the selection that's the problem, it's getting the, it's getting the ad to the client anonymously that's the problem. Any other questions? Okay, then, thanks again. Mm -hmm.